Okay, we now welcome back onto the show famous YouTuber and Sky News After Dark conspirator Daisy Cousins. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, uh, Daisy, this week Australia got brought straight into the Trump impeachment things with all these stories. So how exactly did Australia get into the international news cycle? Well, for some reason, Bill Shorten and Anthony Albanese still fresh off their bitterness after um, unexpectedly losing the election earlier in the year have, have brought up this phone call uh, between Donald Trump and Scott Morrison um, about an investigation into the uh, Mueller report for Russian collusion, which, as we know, turned out to be the greatest conspiracy theory of the past 100 years. Hence the fact I'm not surprised that Trump is wanting to do a bit of an investigation into it. Now, this was a very, according to Scott Morrison, he went on Sky News and did an interview with David Spears, and we know David Spears asks the tough questions, and he did. He said it was a very uneventful phone call, not long at all, where Trump simply said, can you give me a point of contact within the Australian government so we can organise this inquiry? And Scott Morrison said, okay. Now, of course, the media, the uh, the fake news media went nuts over that, and Labour leaders, past and present, went nuts over that and said, oh, oh, the Prime Minister needs to tell us the whole truth with blah, blah, blah. Blah. Well, anyway, it turns out Joe Hockey actually offered Australia's assistance in a letter months ago. And Scott Morrison said that he said yes to Trump simply under the assumption that Australia had already said yes. And that, in fact, considering our alliance with the US is so strong and so long standing, it would actually be unusual for him to say no. So this is another giant furphy concocted by people who have personal vendettas rather than political ones to smear and discredit conservative leaders, evidently, in, obviously in America, but evidently in Australia as well. And um, a lot of my, I did a live, stream, a live stream tomorrow on this very topic. And, you know, one of the questions from the Americans was, hey, this is happening in our media. Is this making the media over there? Or what's everyone reacting? And I'm like, yeah, everyone... Chill out. It's another nothing burger. <laughs> it's okay. Daisy, we were discussing earlier on the show how much the Australian media enjoys one of those rare moments when we're actually in the centre of global affairs. Do you do you see that as well? The Australian losing its mind, the Australian media? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty chuffed with themselves. I'm, I'm, st I'm still sort of getting up to date on, on the coverage. I mean, it's not every day that um, Australia does end up in the middle of the global media landscape. I mean, really, we see that spot taken up by the USA pretty much all of the time with a little bit of relief, I guess, from the UK at the moment with Brexit. But really, it seems to be that American politics is um, the star of the global show. And um, it's interesting, a lot of the, the questions I get from my followers is, why are you so interested in American politics? And I say, well, because it has a giant cultural flow-on effect in Australia. For us, it's sort of like reality TV, you know what I mean? So the only time Australian politics really enters the fray generally is if it's connected to America. So I, I think um, we're all a little bit excited about this and I'm um, interesting to see where it plays. I'm just grateful, though, it's for something as um, trivial, trivial as this and not another leadership spell. Yeah, the other aspect is, like, American politics is just straight up better than Australian politics. I mean, like, the RBA cuts have led the front pages for three straight days. That wouldn't last 20 <laughs> minutes in America before people had moved on to the next thing. It's, yeah, uh, oh, it's just so yeah. much more fun. It is tough. Oh, I fully, I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you. It's very tough to compete when something is very important but as boring as interest rates is dominating the Australian news cycle. Uh, the other, I like what Greg Gutfeld said about it because, like, the Australian thing comes up fresh off the, uh, you know, Trump calling Ukraine president uh, about this stuff. So it, it's clearly like the Democrats went all in on impeachment proceedings. Um, with the Ukraine stuff, that seems to already be starting to lose steam. So immediately the Australian one gets picked up as an international news story. Greg Gutfeld said, like, this is basically a field of dream strategy. If you just build the impeachment proceedings, the impeachment will come. Uh, is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, look, I, I'm really puzzled by um, this whole impeachment thing because they certainly seem to be building on it or at least attempting to build on it. And Nancy Pelosi obviously thinks she has a case. But if you take it step by step, this this phone call that Trump had with the Ukrainian president, I'm sure we've all read it, it was so banal and normal. The only thing that was dedicated to investigating the Bidens was about one paragraph where Trump very sort of lightly said, oh, hey, maybe you could just do this thing for me. They talked about Rudy Giuliani more than they did about uh, investigating the Bidens. So when you look at it like that, um, 
Trump actually hasn't done anything wrong in an objective sense. It's all how you interpret the letter. I mean, I look at, sorry, not the letter, the, uh, the phone call, the transcript. I mean, I look at that and I think, well, I don't really mind world leaders having that kind of conversation, but you can interpret it as, oh, well, perhaps they shouldn't be uh, doing each other favors that aren't of the general public interest, or perhaps you could interpret this as quid pro quo or pressure, etc. So the only way you can pull out, oh, Trump did bad, is if you twist the phone call um, into a particular way. Now, if you compare that to the impeachment of Bill Clinton back in the 90s, where he had really done wrong, including, for instance, per Surgery. I, I mean, he clearly committed crimes there. So it was very easy to build a case and to say, hey, this guy should probably be impeached. Compare this to Trump, and it, it's just so silly. And Nancy Pelosi must know that it is more than likely going to fail because in order to – look, it's likely – I reckon it'll pass the House because the um, Democrats have the majority there. But in the Senate, not only do the – Republicans have the majority, you also need a two-thirds supermajority in order to actually um, kick someone out of office, any public official, including a president. So what on earth is she playing that? All this is going to do is dominate the um, political news cycle for the next four or five months, detract totally from the Democrat presidential candidate's policy, annoy everyone even more by talking about stuff that's a waste of time and money. And my theory is that maybe she's done this because she has zero faith in her 19 presidential candidates and is thinking maybe the way to beat Trump is to have this shadow of impeachment hanging over him. Well, that's an interesting point, Daisy. I was going to ask you about that. What do you think the long-term ramifications are for this? Because we were sort of talking earlier that perhaps actually Trump's base will actually support him more as a result of what they perceive as, you know, uh, the establishment going after him. Well, we can see that in the fundraising, actually. I mean, for for starters, Trump has raised a significant amount more um, than Obama had at this exact point in his presidency, and certainly tens of millions more than any of his um, Democrat contenders. But since this impeachment stuff has happened... They got 50,000 new donations to the Republican National Committee in two days. Okay, two days. So that's really his base absolutely rallying around him completely in the face of yet another kind of pointless smear by the fake news media and, of course, the Democrats. Um, And the interesting thing is I was looking at the polls today about um, who wants impeachment, who doesn't. I was looking at the 538 and let me pull it up here for you so we have these numbers. <clears throat> here we go. So at the moment, 46.7% of the population support impeachment, whereas 45.1% don't support. Now, that is not alarming because that basically mirrors the 2016 election results. So what you hear is, you have here is the same sort of bitter leftists who are going, impeach, impeach, impeach Trump for any little perceived offence. And then the Republicans who are going... God, no, please do it. And then the independence is somewhere in the middle. And if you want to take it party by party, 70, no, 79.6% of Democrats want to impeach, but only 12.1% of Republicans do. So his support is as strong as ever amongst the Republican base and certainly building considering those uh, fundraising donations. Yeah, I saw another very interesting poll that I think President Trump tweeted out from Breitbart showing that 97% of respondents on Breitbart stand with President Trump, which, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un looks at that mm-hmm. and he wonders how to get <laughs> anywhere result. near there. Uh, Daisy, another one, uh, thank you for bringing the hardcore statistics, but if there's one thing Pete and I like on the show, it's memes. And I don't know if you saw Donald Trump this morning <laughs> tweeting out, uh, you know, like just because we're talking about the impeachment. So Donald Trump tweeted out this video. If you can't, if you're listening instead of watching this show, it's basically just a parody of what Joe Biden's dealings with is with Ukraine. So Saul, if you could cue that up, please. Have you ever spoken to your son about his overseas business dealings? I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. Look at this photograph. Every time I do, it makes me laugh. How did our eyes get so red? And what the hell is on Joe? said. Yeah, so for people listening, that was uh, like a photograph playing over a photo of Joe Biden, his son, and a Ukrainian uh, executive playing golf together. Uh, have we reached the pinnacle of meme culture in that the president is just purely communicating <laughs> through memes? I mean, our uh, previous generations had the fireside chats. We now have memes. Books. 
I, I think you might be exactly right there. I, I think Donald Trump has uh, cemented himself as the greatest internet troll of our times. He is the king of Twitter. He is the king of memes. He is the god emperor overlord of the internet. And I've said this a few times. I thought, who to thunk the king of the internet would end up being a 74-year-old man? I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I also just like, uh, I can't believe that song is back on people's radar. That's the first time I've heard that song since year 12 broke up. <laughs> and I'm just glad. <laughs> like, this is Nickelback's biggest moment ever, and it's 15 years after they were relevant. Were I know, Nickelback that's pretty, ever relevant? That's pretty funny. <laughs> that's some pretty good Well, songs. that's the thing. I was never a huge fan of them, but I had a few friends who were. But, um, yeah, I hope, they're, uh, I hope they're thankful to Donald Trump. Even if they hate him, they might be giant lefties. I'm not sure. But at least they'd be thinking, well, at least when the pin tweets on the most notorious Twitter account on the planet's wall. Yeah, their Spotify charts just probably jumped up a fair bit. <laughs> I did uh, I did listen to that this morning, I must admit. <laughs> Brought back a few memories. Uh, all right, so Daisy, let's uh, change topics here for a second. So another thing you've been talking about on your YouTube channel is the climate movement in the wake of Greta Thunberg's speech. Uh, so what do you make of Greta Thunberg? Is she the world's saviour or is she a manipulated teenager? Oh, God. Um, poor Greta Thunberg. I have so much sympathy for that girl. I've made a, a few videos on her. And in the first one I made it clear, um, I'm not dismissing her because she has autism, you know, and depression. There's been plenty of wonderful leaders throughout history who've been struggling with mental health and neurological health. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't take what she's saying seriously. She's an incredibly intelligent girl and obviously very, very driven. The problem is she is being indulged and exploited by adults who really should know better. You've got to think with Greta, she's had an absolute nightmare of a time over since she was about eight years old with her mental health. I mean, she's very open about her Asperger's. She also has autism, obsessive compulsive disorder, history of depression, a history of anxiety. She had an eating disorder when she was 11 that caused her to lose 11, about 10 kilograms in about a month. Plus, there was the selective mutism where for a number of months she didn't talk to anyone except her mother, her father and her sister. And all of this um, was to do with the anxiety she felt over climate change because you look at the conditions she has – that she has, they make her predispositioned to anxiety and fear and fixation. So this isn't a matter of a girl thinking, oh, goodness, well, there's a problem, you know, we've got a problem here and we need to find a solution. She lives in a literal state of genuine terror that she's going to die a premature death because of climate change. Now, ordinarily, a girl in her circumstances would be counseled out of that and protected from this climate alarmism so she can enjoy some sort of quality of life. But here, the opposite is happening. She's being dumped into the spotlight, um, having all her worst fears confirmed by the adults around her the, who have this globalist agenda. And she's not. She's been, you know, in, in the worst possible position, which is, is in the, media, the middle of the media cycle. And I think it's child abuse. Yeah, because, uh, like, when that speech, when she gave that speech to the UN, I was expecting that to be, like, the famous Gillard sexism in Parliament speech. Like, that would be played at schools, it would be played at universities, it would be just, you know, in the culture for months and months afterwards. But it's kind of gone away because I kind of feel that, like, there was a lot of her supporters <laughs> who watched her give that speech and watched the state that she was in and just thought, I don't feel comfortable with this anymore. Like, I, like, I think people are starting to wake up to, hang on, maybe... Uh, Greta Thunberg isn't the saviour and maybe she is being manipulated. Oh, uh, definitely. I, I agree. And I ha I was chatting to um, some people the other day who have very different views of me um, on politics, but we all agreed on Greta. And um, just she looked, she looked like a distressed teenager, you know, saying these terrible things like, you've stolen my dreams and my childhood with big tears in her eyes. I mean, who could look at that and think that's in any way acceptable that she's been allowed to get herself into that state? I mean, I don't have children, but I'm of maternal age, so we say, and my kind of motherhood spidey senses were, 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 were setting off these big alarm bells and I thought you, you, you poor little kid um, so I think people have realised that this is an extreme movement there is extreme pressure being put on her and I hope they're kind of starting to move on and realise that this is not a good scene 
Righto, Daisy, we've got time for one more. We saw Antifa uh, abuse and block an elderly couple from entering a political event in Canada this week. Do we need a hotline for angry Antifa operatives who can't stand old people having an opinion? <laughs> I, I, think we, I think we possibly do. I mean, oh, my God, that that footage needs to be the face of Antifa. Mm. I mean, I talked about this on on your dad's show. Those, that sweet Was that me or Pete? <laughs> I don't know Dad had a show. <laughs> <laughs> he's retired now, so no, he's got to extra time for stuff like that. Oh, of course. No, on the, I talked about it on the Vault Report. Um, but, um, yeah, this sweet little old couple could not have posed a physical threat if they tried, and yet you had these masked thugs yelling in their faces, even though the woman was on a walker. So what, I've, what I think that proves to us is that Antifa's greatest threat, what they perceive as the greatest threat, isn't Nazis or white supremacists or fascists or whatever they talk about. It's dissent. They can't handle dissent no matter who it comes from. So you could be the sweetest little old couple, one of them practically immobile, but if you are heading to an event uh, hosted by people they don't like, in this case it was uh, Dave Rubin and um, Maxime Bernier, then you're evidently a Nazi and evil, and no matter who you are, you're a threat and must be physically intimidated. And uh, that needs to be the face of Antifa. And that needs to be put to people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ayanna Presley, who not only refused on camera to condemn Antifa, they also helped fundraise for them a little while ago by retweeting the bail funds of the um, Antifa activists that were arrested at the uh, trollish straight pride parade. So they're literally fundraising for people who are domestic terrorists. That needs to be put to them to say, hey, you can donate Antifa, you support them. This is also what you support. All right, brilliant. Daisy, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, Make sure you subscribe to Daisy Cousins' YouTube page and, uh, yeah, we'll talk in future. Thank you so much. Great to be there. 